Hi, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andy Oshroff, and I'm the manager of operations for USM's Career and Employment Hub. Thank you all so much for joining our, um, our panel this afternoon. Uh, we're very much looking forward to kind of talking with industry experts about um, the world of computer science. Uh, but first, I'm going to pass it over to Angela and our partners at Project Login, who helped kind of put on this event with us. Thanks, Andy. Hi, everybody. I'm Angela Exley. I'm the director of Project Login. Project Login is a program of Educate Maine, and we exist to sort of grow the, the tech talent development pipeline in Maine and to increase the number of folks working in computing, computer science, and IT jobs. So um, I sort of say that I'm a connector convener, and we bring people together. And so normally, USM and Project Login would be doing um, an event in person, but we have pivoted and we are excited to have this virtual uh, webinar today. So um, thanks to all of the panelists and everybody from industry for joining us and providing insights. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, and yeah, we're very excited to, to be joined by um, folks from industry here and thank you for all your support in putting this on. Um, so for those who are attending, um, please don't hesitate to put any questions that you have in the Q&A chat as we go along here. We'll be happy to kind of bring those up and weave them into our conversation. I'm joined by my co-moderator here, Professor Briggs. Um, and we're, we're just going to kind of open it up first um, for everyone to be able to um, just kind of introduce themselves and their, and their company that they're working with. Um, so first, let me just um, uh, start with Michael, and if you could just introduce yourself to, to folks and talk a little bit about your organization. Absolutely. My name is Mike Prevost. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Vivid Cloud. Uh, I'm really uh, honored, actually, to be able to speak with you and hope I can provide some insights, at least in our corner of the market, our corner of business. Um, Vivid Cloud is a software development service company. Uh, which means we develop uh, software for our clients. Uh, we have clients in the healthcare technology, in industrial markets, in uh, insurance, and in financial services uh, are the big players for now, us now. As a company, we focus on cloud development and IoT. Uh, we think that is where the world is going to be for the next 10 years. Uh, not only do we write new software for our clients, but we also migrate, re-architect uh, existing software and bring it to the cloud. Uh, you probably have heard terms like refactoring and, and migration before, but it really is a very important aspect of life in the software development field is being able to deal with code that other people have written and you have to maintain or revitalize. So that's what my company does. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, why don't we pass it over to Tynan to talk a little bit um, about your background? Sure. Um, I work for Tyler Technologies, uh, specifically for Tyler Detect, um, which is a um, threat hunting service, um, network monitoring service that Tyler, Tyler has. Um, Tyler does a lot of other things, um, software development for basically everything you'd use to run a town. Um, so the stuff you would use for taxes and land and managing uh, utility things, all sorts of stuff like that. So it's a wide gamut of stuff. Um, and cybersecurity happens to be where I work um, in their service provided there. So I'm a manager of a team of analysts um, for the Tyler Detect service. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and why don't we pass it over to Jack? Sure, thanks, Andy. So my name is Jack Yao. I'm the Chief Information Officer at Memic which is the main employer's mutual insurance company. We are a workers' compensation insurance company, which uh, for those of you that don't know exactly what that is, we insure uh, the health basically of employees at different workplaces. So employers are required to have workers' compensation uh, insurance for all their employees. And so if somebody gets injured, we basically uh, work to get them healthy and get them back to work. So that's what uh, what our company does. Uh, listening to, to both Tynan and, and Mike talk about software development, it's, um, 
an insurance company may sound, well, it doesn't sound very sexy compared to that, right? But it is, uh, I've been actually involved in IT uh, in insurance for almost 40 years, both at global services companies, software development companies, startups, and then as well at uh, insurance carriers. And there's a lot of interesting things that go on uh, in companies um, that are taking advantage of a lot of that software that is being written by other folks. Uh, we obviously have our own business to run, so we've got all your typical types of, of software that runs within a company, whether it's finance or HR or communication software and things like that. And then we have all of our core type processing type systems uh, that actually manage the business of policy administration and billing and claims. Uh, and then the things that get really interesting is the, the software that interfaces with our and users, our customers, our insurance agents, insureds, and even injured workers. There's a lot of, of software, web-based software, that with mobile software that gets utilized by those folks. So we really have many different types of customers that we deal with, both internal and external, all of which have all kinds of different varieties of software that we build. So uh, it's probably more interesting than it sounds on the surface. Thank you. Yeah, and I, you know, I think the the diverse different organizations that you all represent um, will be helpful for students and just understanding that you know, being a computer science student doesn't necessarily mean that you're working for a, a specific type of company, but there's all kinds of opportunities. Um, okay, so Evan, last but not least, if you just want to talk a little bit about yourself and your organization. Thanks, thank you, Sandy. Um, it's not too dissimilar from Jack. We also work in the insurance space here at Unum. Um, my role specifically within our digital transformation organization is in our portfolio management office. So I handle a lot of the reporting portfolio management annual planning and how we're actually gonna execute on some of those technical deliverables. And before that, I was actually working in our benefits areas, working with third-party software vendors to test their technologies on our business processes to find efficiencies. Um, and I can't really sum up any more than uh, what Jack said, you know, I'm, but I'm happy to add on a few things is that um, within insurance spaces, you, you can do almost anything if the company is large enough. And I think Unum is, we have a heavy focus on using new predictive analytics for claims triage, claims duration, predictive analytics on where the next vulnerabilities are within our systems. Our cybersecurity operations are massive and a huge part of our technology space. So I think um, the only thing I'd add to what Jack had just stated is there are so many different spaces within the insurance or businesses that aren't like your traditional technology companies to explore opportunities within IT because there's not a whole lot we don't do working from predicting what is the market going to do and what products do we need to support the change and kind of keep up with the modernization of the world at a global scale. And then how do our end users interact with those solutions? And then how do we make sure that those solutions are secure and easy to use and intuitive? Thank you, Evan. And yeah, thank you all for, for those introductions. So I, I love the kind of broad range of experience um, that you all bring. Um, and so recognizing that, you know, many of our students are watching and they're kind of looking to, to kind of make their next step after they graduate, um, maybe a good way to begin um, our discussion here is um, you know, as as folks that are in this industry, um, you know, what what should students be be doing to prepare to apply to your different organizations? How can they make themselves stand out um, to to you in this industry? And uh, just to change up the the order a little bit, why don't we start with Jack? Sure. Boy, that's uh, I could probably go on the whole hour just on that. Um, so I think that there, there's a lot of things, and, and I'll talk a little bit about what I look for maybe when we also uh, have a position that's open and, and we're soliciting candidates. But I think a lot of the things are is to prepare yourself to be as um, curious as you possibly can be. Uh, try to learn as much as you can. Uh, in, you know, probably in the, in the old days, I would say being a specialist was pretty important. Uh, these days, the more you know, the breadth of understanding that you have and the ability to learn new things quickly, I think is really key. Uh, things are changing, as everybody knows, uh, quite quickly. Uh, and so the, the ability that you have to be able to switch gears and learn something new 
uh, I think is going to be important as your career goes on because you're never going to be doing the same thing, I can guarantee you, uh, especially in, in our world, obviously. Uh, so in addition to the, the technical knowledge and being able to learn as much as you can about everything that's out there, uh, some of the things that, that I really look for is you know, some of those soft skills, the ability to be able to communicate well. Um, we obviously deal with customers, whether that's external customers that are purchasing products or internal, quote, customers who are your business partners that you work with in different types of companies. So being able to communicate with them, understand and listen to them, uh, and then be able to describe for them in non-technical terms things that you want them to know or, or things that you're trying to understand for them, I think is really key. So I think there's really a combination of technical skills, the ability to be very nimble and agile and flexible, and you know, always that ability to want to be curious as well as have a passion. You know, have a passion for what you're doing. Um, it, your career is going to be long, and if you're not doing something you really enjoy and are really into, it can make for a, a pretty tiring time. Uh, and so, the more excited you are and make it, as you always hear that, you know, that comment about it's not a job; it's really something you enjoy doing. Uh, will will make certainly for a, a more enjoyable time. But I think a lot of those things are, are what I look for in somebody, both on paper as well as when they come in to talk to us. I, I think that's that's absolutely fantastic um, advice. Um, Tynan, anything that you you might add around um, you know what you look for in in somebody who's new to the team or or in a teammate and and how they can kind of set themselves apart. Sure. I feel like Jack covered a lot of what I was thinking as well, but I feel like the big thing is just being excited and enthusiastic. Um, we hire a lot of, or my, I specifically interview and hire for entry-level positions typically um, for the analyst team, and some individuals will come in. Uh, we hired a guy recently who was a teacher and wanted to transition into information uh, security. Um, he had, he didn't have a, obviously a degree that related specifically, but he had some certifications. He was very excited about um, security. Um, and, and you can apply it to any, anything, whether it's, you know, software development, you know, information security, et cetera. Um, and we could see that he had taken steps on his own to learn more through getting certifications, you know, being self-motivated. And I think if that comes through, uh, when you're, when you're being, you know, when you're doing the interview and the people that are interviewing you will say, wow, this person really cares. And they're showing that they are willing to go above and beyond to expand their knowledge, even if it's not necessarily where they started, um, it, it's just that ability to learn, especially in an entry level position where we're looking at people that don't necessarily have a lot of work experience yet. Um, so basically college students, um, you know, going above and beyond what you learned in class, um, you know, maybe getting a certification that relates. Um, I feel like that makes a big difference, uh, you know, when we're interviewing somebody and whether or not we're going to move forward with them. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that, I think the, the passion and, and being excited about about what what it is that you're entering is um, is going to be really important in being able to kind of put that forward. Um, Mike, um, anything that you would add? Well, Jack and Tynan gave all the good answers, so uh, please take exactly what they say to heart. Uh, I I echo uh, both of their their uh, recommendations wholeheartedly. Uh, my company is is essentially a consulting company, uh, so we step into a client site. And as Jack said, you listen carefully to what the client wants. And you sometimes even read between the lines uh, to find out where their pain points are and stress points are. So before you begin to do your particular job, you have to understand who you're doing the job for. And again, we're a consulting company, so we're our clients. But as Jack pointed out, uh, you could be doing a job, a task for your colleagues within your own company. And the rules are exactly the same. Make sure you know what the person and the organization that you are doing work for, what they really need and what they really expect. It's, it's hugely important. And the other thing I, I think I would just like to add to, to what both of the gentlemen before me said is uh, the military has had a, a, uh, a, a learning philosophy for a long time. And it's summarized by saying, watch one, do one, and then teach one. So they follow this philosophy, uh, even in, in the, the medical corps of, of the military. And the idea behind that is there is nothing better than getting your hands on something and doing it. 
that really solidifies what you've learned uh, in the books, in the classroom environment. But if you really want to gain an understanding of a topic, teach it because it'll show you where your own gaps in knowledge are, but it also allows you to reach out and, and spread some of that knowledge. Uh, we have a very, very mentorship driven corporate culture here at Vivid Cloud, and it's not by accident. It was a very deliberate decision and program that we create. Everyone below the level of vice president in this company has a mentor, and there are monthly check ins with your mentor mentees. And what we are encourage all of our people to do is engage in uh, various internal training and educational processes for themselves, but also for each other. So we, uh, we ask our people uh, to put together what we call lunch and learns, uh, where they will take a topic, it may be a design pattern that's very common in some space. And uh, you know, we'll have a, a person who might only have two or three years of experience explain the design pattern and, and, and present a, a, a utilization of this uh, design pattern in a real world situation. Uh, and that turns out to be extremely helpful for the presenter, as well as for the people who receive that kind of knowledge from, uh, from these sessions. So think about that, learn one, do one, teach one. I love that. Learn one, do one, teach one. Uh, and I, uh, in particular, I think, you know, the mentor mentee relationship can be so impactful and, um, and really kind of help folks move along. Uh, Evan, tough, tough act to follow. Um, but anything that you would add to what um, Jack Tynan and Mike have said already? Uh, it, it is a tough act to follow. And I was actually taking some mild notes on the side and finding some gaps. And every time I thought, oh, this will be something to touch on, it was immediately mentioned. Um, but there are some things that I do want to follow up with on the um, on what Mike mentioned about watch one, do one, teach one. I think when you switch from the curriculum and structure of school into the world of full-time employment, there's an interesting shift where your work might not be so well-defined. And I think uh, the other member of the group did a great job of touching on understanding what your client wants and then reading between the lines and maybe defining what they actually need. But it's oftentimes difficult to do that if you don't understand the core of that business or that the purpose of that work. So I think doing that next level, because, you know, sometimes we get um, a little bit siloed in technology to be so focused on making the newest, most sleek interface, making the user experience as seamless as possible without really understanding what the purpose behind that is. And that's where a lot of things get lost in the sauce, if you will. Um, so I think it's really important to understand what the business actually wants and drives. But also, too, one day you'll be in the driver's seat defining those requirements and making those decisions. So once you can, if, if you take an early step and an early step and to be proactive about understanding the business needs and the operations and how technology supports that, then when you're more in the driver's seat, you can do a better job of creating definitions for the technical support you're getting. It'll just make it all the more smooth in the long run. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Uh, so I, I'll ask uh, each of you one more question then I'll, I'll pass it over to Professor Briggs to, to ask a question of you. Um, but so we, we have, um, you know, all of these students that are, are maybe looking for internships, maybe looking for jobs and, um, you know, there, there is kind of this debate or, or maybe less of a debate, but more of a concern around, um, you know, when they're applying, how intensive are, is the technical review of, to the application process? First, you know, some of the other pieces like the, you know, the 21st century soft skills and, and kind of what, you know, how does the, the process work and how, how do students show off their technical skills versus kind of how well rounded they are. Um, and um, Evan, maybe I, I'll start with you um, just um, <laughs> so you can kind of lead off on this one and then we'll, we'll work our way back around. Sure. Um... And I, I think, you know, when it comes to interviewing and how intensive can they get, um, I think it depends company to company. I'd say within ours, it's not so much siloed. Um, we take a very holistic approach and it's, you know, oftentimes up to manager preference and what they're looking for in that specific individual. So we have some roles where it's very structured. Yes, this is an interview process, but there's a little bit more where it's um, fluid and holistic in approach. That being said, um, one plus one will always be two. So if somebody's asking you to understand or to, to write an algorithm on a whiteboard and explain it 
after giving you some requirements. I think the, the math part will always be fairly standard, but going back to the previous question, those soft skills and how you deliver that solution and make it from you know technical jargon to plain English is a really important thing that's oftentimes overlooked because we get so laser focused on the, this is the ask, this is the solution, and this is what it does. But how are you actually conveying that message in a way that makes sense? And are you conveying that message confidently? And is it also maybe a creative solution? And do you do a decent enough job of saying, okay, yes, those are the requirements, but are you sure? Because if I do that, it'll do this. And then taking that next level, um, I guess, uh, trying to think of the word, but that, that um, being proactive again in your approach to understand the operations and what is that driving towards? Because sometimes they'll hand you a set of requirements. It's like, okay, great, you built that solution, but is it optimal? Are there other things you could do to make it less redundant and more efficient? So I'd say, you know, think about both sides of the coin when you're in those, um, in those interviews processes. Awesome. That, that's great advice. Um, so continuing to bounce around here, uh, why don't we go over to, to Tynan? Um, technical versus kind of the other aspects during, uh, you know, the hiring process. Sure. And, um, you know, obviously it's an internship. We're not expecting subject matter experts or people that have any really experience whatsoever outside of what they might have done at school. And, you know, and again, no one likes to do interviews, I don't think, <laughs> especially when you're, you know, in college and maybe, you know, maybe you're younger and it's kind of nerve wracking. You're at some big building and, you know, whatever, you know, so we take all that into account, you know. Um, but getting into it, we, we have a little bit of a quiz that we'll give. Um, you know, ask some questions, hey, you know, just technical stuff. And almost more so whether they know it or not is, is whether they're able to admit that they don't know it and then show that they're trying to learn. You know, I don't know this, but let me try to think around it. And then you maybe get to the end and you realize, well, I just have no idea. You know, how do you, how do you convey that you don't know <laughs> and that you're, you know, not trying to kind of make it seem like you know more than you do? Um, I think honesty and, and like I said before, um, you know, a excitement for it, you know, hey, I, I don't know this now, I'm learning, I really want to, you know, this is why I want to do the internship, because I want to learn more, get some real world experience, um, is what we're, we're looking for. So really, you know, honesty, um, uh, drive, um, and, and, you know, getting into the soft skills, being able to express yourself in a confident way, whether you know the answer or you don't. Great. Uh, yeah, I, I can appreciate that. Having uh, being a person who doesn't certainly doesn't know the answer all the time and being able to to kind of be able to navigate that. Um, let's let's bounce it over to Mike. So I'm a, a very big believer in internships. Uh, I the school I went to uh, was Drexel University in Philadelphia, and that school is a cooperative education program. So a four year degree takes five years to do because you're spending four cycles out in industry. Three of those cycles are six months long and the final one is, is three months long. And that taught me so much about what, it, what it's like to, to be a working engineer in the field and what options are available to me career pathwise. At least it, it gave me a deeper dive into the businesses that I had the opportunity to, to work for. Uh, at Vivid Cloud, we are trying to create a, an internship program. It is hard, though, for us because as a service company, every hour of our time is charged to a client. And with, a, with an incoming uh, intern without a lot of subject matter expertise, it's really hard for us to, uh, to expose an intern to our clients. Um, and the other challenge for us is time. Uh, we are involved usually in very meaty projects. Uh, the minimum duration, it seems, is, is about a year. Uh, we're on projects that have three and four year arcs uh, that involve you know, dozens of people. So it is uh, a bit of a challenge for a typical three month summer internship for us to work with that. But, but we're working toward that. Um, but I think some of the advice given about confidence in the interview is important and, and, and don't worry about it if you are nervous. Uh, people, uh, especially like Jack and I, who've been around the, the block a few times, we know what that's like. And, and managers, like everyone at this table, have developed that skill to help put people at ease and let you know that you know, flubbing a word or, or flubbing a, a statement is not... <laughs> 
the end of anything. So, so get into that interview, try to enjoy the interview. Uh, ask as many questions as, as you can. Um, as we've all been saying, be curious, find out about what they need, what they want, what they do. And if you are in an interview like that and you're making it pro and you're having a proactive participation in the interview, first of all, your nervousness will go away. But most of all, you're really going to learn something from the interview uh, and they're going to learn a lot more about you when you're asking questions. They're going to they're going to see the direction of your thinking, what what is important to you. Um, and they're also going to see that what is what's important to them is important to you. So I guess that's those are my thoughts. That's great. And, you know, and trying to enjoy the interview is going to be a novel concept for, I think, a lot of, a lot of students as they embark on this journey. Um, Jack, switching over to you, uh, any, any thoughts to add? Yeah, I think that, you know, everybody has, has said a lot of really good things. Um, I think that certainly some of the, the early on interviews that, that you take in your career, um, yeah, you're going to be nervous and there are a lot of things that you can try to do to kind of turn it around a little bit. And I think what Micah was saying is, is that asking questions, thinking of what it is you're trying to find out about this company you're interviewing at, uh, because you're really interviewing each other, right? It's just, even though it may not seem that way, uh, walking into an interview, you really are, because you want to be sure that you're going to work for a company that is going to be a good fit for you. Uh, and that has the same kind of values, frankly, that you have. And so there are things that you want to be prepared to ask to find out what they have to say. And frankly, whether they're being very open and honest about their environment, uh, just like they're trying to do the same thing with you to find out. So I think it's important for you to be prepared to try to figure out what it is you want to learn about what it's like to work at this company and ask those very frank questions. Uh, when we're talking to people, I think that, you know, in addition to all the typical types of, of technical questions you'll ask, just to get a sense of what they know and what they don't know, it's more about how they think, right? You're really trying to get to the bottom of, are, is there good critical thinking in this person? Uh, what they know technically, as I said before, they're gonna, you're going to be learning all kinds of things along the way. So how do they think? How do they go about thinking when they're presented with a situation? So whether it's a scenario-based type question that they're gonna to pose to you, uh, a lot of it is, okay, where do they go with this? Because if you think about the real world that you're gonna be dealing with, that everybody has talked about, you're gonna be presented with needs, problems, uh, things that you're gonna to try to have to come up with solutions for. And how somebody thinks really can make or break how that how good they are at doing that right and finding those people that are real broad thinkers and can critically try to solve a problem how do they go about doing that problem solving is a really tough skill uh, and hard to find really good people in that area so i think that's a lot of what we try to ask uh, is to get to that root of can they do that well uh, but as Mike mentioned, internships, we've used internships pretty successfully. Uh, I will say many years ago, I, I wasn't all that big a fan of them. And frankly, it, it came down more to the way the employers handled it and really didn't focus and really pay attention to it. And it was just something they were doing, but there wasn't a whole lot of, of commitment on the part of the company to do it. Uh, but I will say that the, the internships we do at Memic, uh, both the people, the responses and feedback they've given us, as well as ourselves, we get a huge amount from them and they get a huge amount from us. Right? There's an often, and one of the things we try to do in our IT organization is we normally have four or five interns just within the IT department in different areas. So we'll have one as, as a developer, we'll often have one in, uh, person in that's working on our help desk one that's generally either a BA, we have often project management uh, person in there as well. Uh, and then sometimes we will have infrastructure or security related person. And what we try to do is we try to come up with a project that involves all of them. So they can actually almost work as a team, working with employees in each of those respective disciplines so that they learn first, what all those jobs are all about in the real world, but then they also have a team that they can feel real close to that they can work on trying to build something. Uh, and so we've done that on a couple of occasions where we've had our PM actually manage the project that these 
interns were going to work on. We had a BA getting gathering the requirements. We had the developer working with the security person to build a solution on a web-based solution. And it was fascinating to watch how they interacted as a group and then how they worked with all of us. And in, at the end, they showed us the end result and it was great. So, you know, I think internships can really give you a sense of what it's like to work out there, uh, what these jobs are really all about before you have to make a decision as to what is it you really want to do. Uh, and then it also, I think, benefits the company to be able to see these folks in action. And we've hired quite a few of the people that were interns. Uh, and so I think it's great for, for both sides. Thank you. And I, yeah, I love that idea of a intern kind of cohort that can collaborate and learn together. I, I think that is really helpful. Um, with that, that kind of peer engagement and peer learning. Uh, Professor Briggs, so you're, you're you know, connected daily with, with these students. Um, you know, any, any kind of questions that you've heard in, in working with students day to day that you think that um, these panelists might be able to, to answer? I, uh, students are always, wanting to know what the career possibilities are. And I feel like I'm not looking for work and I don't you know, know exactly the great extended variety we have out there for them to do. So I think uh, it would probably be good for us to develop a, a, a program where companies, if you're interested, this is the kind of thing we could have somebody come and give a little talk uh, about what you do and what kind of uh, skills you wanna see if it, you know, it takes some of your time, but um, that's something that might might help. The uh, that's their main question is what are their opportunities? I don't hear a lot. I mean, most of our students that once they're in their program, they're pretty engaged in it. Uh, they like that you know either they'll try it and fail and get out in a hurry, or if they like it, they stick with it and they like doing their programs and, and uh, exercising together. The listening to what you had to say before, I. Uh, I'm really, I find it very interesting because it sounded like an important issue was bridging the technical to non-technical communication gap. And I just am curious as to what tools mean. I teach a database course and we find, I think the ER model is a very handy model. It's pictorial and so forth. But I wondered what other um, tools or concepts you use for that. We don't give them a lot of practice talking a lot. We're, and there's something else I want to talk with you about in a minute, but I'm just curious to hear what the panelists um, have used in the past that they thought in their own experience or what the uh, what your outfit promotes, um, people that are dealing with non-technical uh, clients, what, what you suggest they do and, and uh, so we can relay that. I'm always, and I, I told Andy when he asked me to do this, gee, I don't know if I have a lot to offer, but I think I could learn a lot by being on the panel. So, um, I, uh, I'll just go in um, alphabetical order, and I'd say that puts Evan first, at least for the first question. We'll go reverse alphabetical order. So, so the question is, what is useful in bridging that technical, non-technical uh, communications gap? It, what, what do you think would help? Yep. So I, I'd say um, maybe exposure therapy, and I think um, Jack and Mike mentioned it uh, a ton. You know, internships are a great way to get that whether it's co-oping and extending your career or um, Unum offers something we call the scholars program, where we offer students the ability to work part-time while they're in school so they can manage a, um, a caseload 20 hours a week. They'll be put on a migrations team. They'll be put on an XYZ team, security, maybe a con conversation as a service team, whatever we have available and a need for and whatever fits the best, um, I guess, uh, experience or skills of the applicant. You know, we have over 300 positions that we'll be hiring for in 2021 spread across data analytics, cybersecurity, you know, user experience, senior software engineers, entry-level software engineers. There's, when you, so when you ask about like what would help bridge that gap experience and then what's available after that, what kind of jobs are there? I'd say it's limitless, but also too, when you talk about the entity um, or the ER framework, <clears throat> I think it's good to have conceptual understanding of those things. But like we mentioned in the first question, as soon as you put out a technology, it's out of date and you have to update it. You know, as soon as you publish a product, 
the, you know, your next few releases are going to be updating that product. It's like, oh yeah, we did it. We released it to production. That's all well and good, but now you have to change it because it's out of date. So I'd say, you know, learning how to communicate the needs of the newer technologies and more important and the best way to get that is through experience, whether it be working part-time with a company through something like the scholars program, getting as many internships as you can, or honestly, if you can build a network, just ask folks, hey, can I come shadow you? I have, I don't have class on Friday. I'd like to learn more, okay. be proactive and reach out because I think if somebody reached out to me and said, hey, I'd like to learn more about what you do, I could, yeah. if, I, if I'm not in that role, I have a broad enough network within Unum to connect you to somebody that does. I know it might be a little bit difficult to do virtually, but um, you know, there, we're all here virtually too and there's ways to work around that. So really actual experience in the field is in your view, the best way. Because I'm presuming then you're dealing with a lot of non-technical people, so you're going to be forced to to find ways right. to communicate. Yeah, and and I think you know, experience also too in school. You know, co-ops are a great thing if you can find ways to partner with um with companies that maybe sponsor projects through your university, or if you're given those maybe in your senior year some technical uh, pr final projects. I know one of mine was building out a fully functioning website for a fake bakery that we made that had to auto repopulate or auto order inventory it had to have analytics on the inventory we had to be able to add remove update security permissions it was a fairly robust project that we did my senior year so if you have some of those capstone hmm. projects that will provide you some of that technical depth or if you have even smaller projects that will give you enough know-how to speak to it and then be able to have that um, I guess, element of critical thinking to say, oh yeah, I did this in my class. And because you're describing this work, I think those two things relate like so. Um, bridging that gap and having that ability to critically think about how your experience can be applied to real world problems, I, I think is crucial. Yes, uh, sounds like a very complicated uh, piece of software. Thanks. Um, so Tyna, what do you think about um, making what can we do in particular at the university to help students overcome the gap between uh, technical knowledge and and stuff when they're dealing with clients that may not be able to follow what they're saying sure the first thing that came to my mind <clears throat> excuse me when you said that is i feel like when i give a presentation i feel like i need a lot of background information on what i'm talking about so i can feel like i know what i'm talking about because if you know just enough I don't know. I just feel uncomfortable with that. So I just was thinking, you know, I wasn't a computer science major myself, but I'm thinking about oral presentations on what you did. You know, it, it, a couple of the guy, I can't remember if it was Mike or Jack mentioned teaching. Yeah, it was Mike teaching. Yeah. You know, if you can teach something or teach, this is how this works, this is how it functions. And maybe if you're deliberately trying to say it in a non-technical way, like you're explaining it to, you know, an upper level person at a company that maybe isn't technical, I feel like that's going to give somebody a leg up. Yeah. Yeah. Now I was thinking how we could do that. Um, I, you know, I share that view. You, you'll, you'll discern if you don't understand it and try to explain it to somebody else. Say, well, I don't know. You know so exactly. um, it's a, a good exercise for sure. Um, well, Mike, Michael, uh, what do you think about this? Is there any? Silver bullet. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up right where Tynan uh, left off because we we really do believe that putting uh, a person in charge of explaining something is uh, is is a very fertile ground for for learning how to do this. Um, I don't know if the students at USM, while they're students, get much exposure to the Agile methodology, but it's almost certainly going to be the primary software development methodology that you will use in your, your career, at least until they invent something better. But uh, Agile has a, a number of ceremonies, they call them, and the last two ceremonies are, are a, a review of the work that has just been done, but also a retrospective of what has happened and how the work most recently done fits into the larger project. And we uh, involve all of our team members. Uh, you could be a person two months out of school and if you participated in that sprint, that piece of work that was done, you are part of the review and part of the retrospective. And that forces uh, all of us, not just uh, not just the, the people just starting their career, but all of us to step back and make sure that we understand what work we're doing and how it fits into the larger picture. Uh, and when I work with my mentees, uh, I always slow them down 
and when they want to dive in 10 miles deep into explaining a technical matter or issue, I slow them down and ask them to explain what the driving requirements are or explain uh, the, the primary challenge or problem that they were dealing with. I want them to explain even to other technical people what the big picture is first, what they are about to accomplish, and then they can dive in. And by forcing them to do that with every discussion, um, it, it, it builds that ability to bridge the technical and non-technical gap. Um, and as far as career paths, uh, with a, a service company like ours, uh, there, there are quite a bit. Um, obviously, there's the, there are the software development jobs that your, your head is down and you're pounding out code for, for weeks at a time and you get that thrill of creation, that, that thrill of building something and see it, see it work. Um, but you, you, we also have uh, career paths that are more involved with, with business development, which is my central role with, with the company now. Um, I no longer write code myself. My hands-on engineering days are behind me, but I do a very technical sell to very technical clients. Um, and part of that work is, again, listening to what they need, responding with, with writing proposals, uh, doing estimates, building even prototypes and proof of concepts as part of uh, winning business with them. So if, if you like interacting with people and you like being involved in the very, very beginning steps of a project, don't, don't discount the value of, of a business development role the technical side of it. Uh, these jobs are often called application engineers or systems as engineers. And it usually takes some experience before you are able to do that effectively. It's not something that you would step into right out of school. But if you are thinking about what path your career is on, there are some people who just really don't want to sit in, in a queue working with just a small team, uh, you know, day after day, year after year. They really like getting out there and seeing and being exposed to a lot of different opportunities uh, with the company that they work for. So don't discount a, a, a technical role within a business development organization. Yeah, um, I think I would imagine that'd be the case that um, because you do have to deal with not, I mean, there are a lot of different places where technical knowledge fits in, but may not be, um, strictly um, a coding position. Um, Jack, I don't want to leave you out. So um, why don't you um, off, you know, say whatever you think about this. And, and I wanted to say one thing, we've got another 13 minutes or so. So uh, there was one thing I wanted to just mention to you, to you all uh, is going on at USM, um, but. Yep, no, I can keep this brief. Uh, I mean, I well, think no, there I don't, I don't need to. <laughs> Go, whatever you want to say. That's okay. No, not a problem. Uh, I I think one of the things that you know I remember back when uh, I had to think about public speaking, and it was something I never liked to do. Uh, yeah, you're uncomfortable. You're nervous as heck getting up in front of large groups of people. Uh, but a couple of things that were said um, by the other folks here uh, really struck me. And one of the things was I know that that Tynan had mentioned that. If you're not comfortable with the subject, it makes it really, really difficult, right, to be able to get up and, and talk to people. Uh, and that is often where public speaking can come in. Number one, you can work on your presentation and your ability to, to literally communicate to other people. But one of the exercises I remember in classes that I had taken around this, uh, and I wish, frankly, I had done this in college rather than afterwards, but uh, is that you're, you're posed with a topic and you have 30 seconds to come up with what you're going to talk about on this topic. And so very quickly, you have to th think, again, all that critical thinking. How do I want to go about communicating? What am I trying to communicate? How do I get there? What's the story I'm going to say? Uh, and so I think that even public speaking classes, as crazy as that sounds like probably to technical people that are in college, uh, again, I, I don't think there are enough avenues you can take to help improve how well you can communicate, uh, regardless of what technical role you're going to get into. Uh, I mean, I think it's unless you're in a really large shop, uh, it's it's hard to hide th these days and not be able to communicate. Right? There aren't too many just pure heads down people that that's all they do. Right? 
so I think the more you can get out and communicate with folks and be able to explain concisely and clearly uh, on different topics, I think is key. Uh, be able to bridge that, that technical, uh, non-technical role. Uh, as far as careers, uh, you know, as Evan said, it is really limitless. I mean, there is no better time to be in IT than it is right now. Because technology is in everything everybody does now. Uh, and so there are so many different roles and, and jobs that are out there. Uh, and to me, it's a matter of figuring out what it is you do well and what is it you really love to do. And I guarantee you there are things within IT that are gonna fit that bill one way or another, whether it's very technical or more on the business side, right? There are many different things you can do. And I think just figuring out what it is you're good at and what you like, I think is really key uh, to be able to then forge that direction. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention the other thing, a lot of you have talked about internships and um, I'm gonna put in the Q and A if it copied properly, this is, do I have to open a question or something? I've never used this before, Andy. Can I just paste something in there? No. So the participants will be able to, to post something in there, but you can post something in the chat. In the chat. Okay, I'll put it in chat then. Chat, let me see, pop it up. So we have this new engaged, come on chat, pop up here. There we go, to everybody. So we have this new engaged learning requirement um, as part of the core curriculum for every student at the U USM has to do this starting well, maybe last year was the first time it was in the catalog. But the uh, we see our students as uh, meeting this requirement through internships and roughly I was on the I was on the core committee when this was developed and I took it as something get them out of the classroom get them doing something with other people that are not professors in a collaborative or the, um, environment where they have to communicate with other people and show some initiative and reflect on what they learned in the classroom too. And I think this is an outstanding possibility for two-way communication between um, us to the companies about what we're teaching and then us back to us. You know, I'd, I'm working on a, a format for our internships so that uh, they're more structured and meet these learning outcomes. I, I just put up there. And also I'd like to have some, get some feedback from companies about if they thought our students were weaker in some areas than others. So we would know how to adjust our curriculum too. But um, anyway, that's the kind of thing I wanna communicate more with companies on how interested they are. If this becomes a much more structured kind of thing where there has to be an explicit plan. And what I'd be looking for is a regular communication with a supervisor in the company. I don't know how much, you know, at least once a week, have a chance to talk with somebody and uh, tell them that they're doing something well and not so well or whatever, not just kind of a, a thing where they're left in a room by themselves all the time. Um, so I'd like, I don't know if any of you would be interested or be willing, I should say, uh, to receive a, a proposal for me and comment on it or something about what I'm thinking of structuring for an internship for us. But I, uh, and. Or, or if you, here's the other thing, if any of you have some existing formats that you use that you'd share with us so we could examine them. But I, uh, this is something that everybody in the university, so it doesn't have to be just the computer science and IT people. It can be, um, you know, if you have other contacts within your outfit of other areas that would be interested that, um, in uh, having more structured internship, you could maybe go to departments that would be, um, their candidates would be coming from. So I don't know how we can squeeze it in. If you want to say, maybe there's four of you. So we've got maybe a couple of minutes each of um, what you think goes into making a strong internship program. What, what do you, what would you say, gee, this is critical. That's, that's a question I could pose. Um, what are your recommendations for internship programs, specific features of them? Okay, and now it's the reverse. This is like on a stack. So Jack, why don't you start? <laughs> okay. Jack, uh, just before you get started, uh, uh, just um, a couple of, of logistical pieces. So we do have until 2.30, so no, no time pressure um, oh. here. And, and participants who are in the, the, 
the chat there. Don't hesitate to post anything in the Q and A, and we'll we'll add that into the conversation. Uh, but Jack, please go ahead. Uh, sure. So I think, uh, David, I think one of the the key things is that there is some end goal they're trying to achieve. Um, and whether that's a defined project, whether it's uh, I, I want to learn X or I want to learn Y, I mean, I think each, the program needs to either the individuals need to, to, to work through that or the program is going to present something to them. But I think having a defined result you want to achieve by the end of that internship is key, just like it is with, with any of the work that we have, right? There is some deliverable that you want to end up with so that people can work together to plan out how you're going to get there. What are all the things you need to, to get involved? Because then you're starting to involve not just my technical skill, but my planning skills and my ability to be able to think through some of these things. So I think it, it creates a, an environment where there's a lot more involved but it's also when they're finished, then you have the opportunity to have them present what that thing was to a group of people. So they get into that, again, outward communication deal. So I think that is probably one of the things I would think would be important to start with. Sounds to me like, so you go into the internship, but you have almost a plan for how it's gonna unfold before you even um, start it. So yep. you work up a plan. This is what I wanna go and This is the sort of the, and that they might need help from Somebody Absolutely. The company. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I would yeah. see that being a bilateral thing that you could work together to come up with. Thank you. So reverse. So it's Michael. Well, uh, again, I have the uh, the advantage of adding to stuff that uh, Jack has said, and 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 what I would add to it is that uh, a mentorship approach is is extremely important because these are people who are just learning uh, what it is. So they have to have some additional guidance beyond just handing handing them a project, which I've seen in, in some companies before, and, and those companies tend to struggle with internships. But if, if, uh, if a company that approaches it the way the Jack's company does is is going to be successful. So, so have a, a defined uh, goal uh, in mind, uh, mentor the, the, the people in that program to get the most out of them and they can get the most out of you. And thirdly, um, I think there's real value in having interns actually create something, deliver something, because there's it, it, there's a, it's a point of pride, right? It's something that they can take away with them and they realize that they have done something important to the company. It's not been a one-way street. You know, when you say that about um, mentoring, it makes it, what I kind of read, how I read that is that you'd be kind of supportive, give them confidence that they don't have to get it right all the time, which was something mentioned earlier too, that this is a learning experience and they're not expected to know everything already. Exactly right. Well, thank you. Um, so Tynan, I guess you'd be up next. I feel like I'm flashing you along here. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah, kind of like Mike said, um, it, it, Tyler's internship program is it, it really awesome. I, of course, I say that working here, <laughs> but um, but you know, it, it, it's a big, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a big deal, and we love the interns. And, and I'm thinking about what Mike was saying is give them something to do that's like a real thing, like and they're going to do it and be proud of it. I'm thinking about a little issue we had with an internal application we use all the time. And suddenly one day it was fixed and I talked to the guys like, oh, yeah, the intern fixed that. I'm like, awesome. You know, so just stuff like that. It, and it was a, it was a pretty basic thing, you know, nothing too crazy, you know, but something to feel like you really made an impact in, in the real work going on at the company. Um, that's from a software development standpoint. From a, a Tyler Detect threat hunting standpoint, we train our interns to act as one of our analysts would. So they get the same training the analyst does. They're doing the same work the analyst would do, um, which also makes it really handy when we want to hire them. Um, but anyway, just putting them in charge of something that they can really feel like they're doing something. Um, and then Tyler also has a lot of programs where the interns will get together for various types of meetings and different sorts of things, all sorts of, it's, it's really involved you know, pretty cool. I wish I had done it, um, you know, but just getting them involved with each other, with the company, kind of getting a taste of the company's culture while they're an intern. Cause like you guys have said, you know, it's a two-way street, you know, you might intern somewhere and be like, wow, I never want to work there, you know, but you know, if you're able to present the culture, it's going to give them an idea of, you know, is this the kind of place I want to be at? Is this the kind of job I even want to do? 
you know, you don't want to get into something and feel like, well, I made a mistake. Um, so, you know, really that getting them into something that they're really working on something real, and then also giving them a taste of the company with the cultures like there, I feel like is a really important thing. Something I feel like Tyler does really well. Yeah, we've had a lot of people intern at Tyler and then go on to work there. Um, yeah. You know, one thing you mentioned too about doing activities with the interns collectively, um, I've had some talk with people about having that for Portland. There are people I know that want to develop Portland as more of a, a destination for people from out of state that have technical training too. And, and they felt if they could get, because of course Maine, it's really nice, especially in the summer. So um, I think that's a, a useful thing. It's something that might have to go beyond the company because I think a smaller company might not have enough interns to make it much of a gathering, but maybe there's a way we could get an umbrella uh, organization or something. I don't know, I'd have to look into that myself. If a it used to be Mesda, you know, when, um, I can't think of his name, but it was more of a software professional uh, organization that would sponsor this kind of thing. But thanks, Tynan, that, that was useful to me. Okay, so Evan. All right. Um, uh, <laughs> Speaking from personal experience, you know, I've had um, in one way, shape or form, whether it's a co-op or a summer internship in my um, in my scholastic career, I managed to get six of them under my belt. Um, so I know not all of them will be good and some of them will be great, right? So I think when I'm thinking back on my own experience, what made good internships great or what set them apart, I'd say um, there's four things really in my mind. And one is mentoring, one is ownership, collaboration and visibility. So when I think about mentorship, obviously you need an involved manager that checks in on you and kind of helps you develop in your career path and better define opportunities. But you also need that buddy who's kind of your, your no stupid questions person, because sometimes it can be intimidating when you walk into an office for the first time or you're interacting with somebody virtually, especially now, you don't get that human touch. So who's going to be your buddy to kind of develop those soft skills, be the, the person that kind of represents this is who we are at work. This is how we operate. And we're all just people at the end of the day, not necessarily just employees. I think that's really important from like a mentoring self-development perspective. And when I say ownership, I'm, I'm thinking along the lines of what Tynan said, you know, we want you to own something real, own a deliverable, own a piece of a team and say, this is your work and you own it. And whether that's something that was created and you're helping enact change that was previously, you know, in motion or whether you're defining change and then creating the change and then delivering it and socializing that change, those are all really good things. And how do you collaborate? Because you can't just do something all on your own. So there has to be some interdepartmental um, work. And that was always one of the questions I asked my companies that I was interviewing for is how interdepartmental is your work? How much exposure will I get outside of my desk writing code or outside of my desk, you know, just receiving requirements and going away at it? How much will I get exposure and how can I learn about your company, but also the industry that we're in? Um, so I think collaboration is really important. And then visibility, because if you own your work, you'd better have your name stamped on it as well. And it's one way, shape or form. And I think that's oftentimes up to managers to understand that, yes, they manage the success of a team and they're driving towards something, but ultimately the team members are the ones delivering the solution. So am I getting pulled into the appropriate agile um, ceremonies where I can speak to the product? Am I involved when there's a question? It's like, oh, we're doing a cybersecurity update. Great. Are the people who worked on that piece of the project in the room with me to speak to it, even if I'm the manager, right? Because I want to make sure that they're getting the credit that they deserve. And I think um, specific to Unum, you know, being a relatively large company, we always have, I think, 20 plus interns at each site. It, it feels like in the last couple of years, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but um, there's a great intern community. And there's also a specific intern business case challenge each summer, which is more of a, you know, it truly is a business case. You're presented with a few problems. You have a, usually a technology coach, if you will, and a business coach. And you work with them to kind of define your solution. And at the end of the summer, you present to whoever wants to attend in the company, which is usually upwards of a couple hundred folks. And throughout your internship, you also get good visibility to senior leaderships where senior leaders, where they have um, small group sessions where maybe it's the executive vice president of our legal counsel comes and talks to all interns. So it's not like IT just kind of siloed off in the corner being IT and supporting the business. You get exposure to finance, legal and IT leadership. And it just kind of creates a really good community and understanding of what do we actually do and how can you have your own impact? Um, sounds good. I'm just looking over what I've been typing for notes. Um, 
one last thing. This pe couple of people, I think, mentioned shadowing. And that's not, you know, that's more like, uh, I wouldn't call it an internship, but you think when you're when you think of shadowing, do you think that's like a weekly kind of thing? Student comes in, not just one day, but more than one time. I'm not really sure I understand what the what the concept is for that. Uh, but I think I can solve that. I don't I don't want to get it back to Andy because he knows he just said the this could go on longer than than uh, the one hour I thought it was going to go on for, but um, so I don't want to. I'm not sure what the parameters are, and I don't want to if um, occupy you folks more than I deserve to. <laughs> no, Professor Briggs, I you know I think that that's a good a, a really good question, and and maybe I, I can fold this into another question that I have. So, Evan, um, you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, by the time you launch a product in this environment, you're already working on kind of the next iteration and the next update. And I think for a lot of students, that's a concern about how to, to make sure that they're staying on top of the newest and latest knowledge and, um, and just staying relevant um, with an industry that changes so rapidly. And, you know, Job Shadow is a part of that, but maybe, uh, you know, a more general question is, um, what advice would you give to students to be able to kind of showcase how they are continuing to learn and how they're continuing to stay relevant? Um, and yeah, I, I don't know um, if anyone wants to, to start, um, but Mike, I, I don't think I've picked on you first yet. So maybe I'll start with you. Well, to, to address the job shadowing. It's, uh, it's an interesting concept. Um, we employ uh, that technique, uh, not so much as an internship, but really as part of, of us understanding what our clients do. Um, a good example is uh, we, we got a project to, with a, a company that creates water filtration systems. And uh, this is a, a big time company. They, uh, they provide water filtration systems for municipal water supplies, food and beverage companies. Uh, so it's not something that most people get involved with. What do you know about water filtration systems? Uh, so in order for us to understand what it is that a process control engineer does in the world to, to uh, manage these systems, uh, look where problems, diagnose problems and, and even fix problems with these systems, we do a shadowing. We, we will walk uh, with, uh, you know, with our clients, in this case, a process control engineer, as they go through their plant and deal with the various filtration systems there, and they will talk us through their thought processes on, on what they are looking at and why they're looking at it and what they're looking for. And that helped us tremendously build a set of mobile apps and web apps uh, that uh, as well as our cloud backend system that would give these, these process uh, control engineers, uh, give the business people uh, all visible access into the filtration systems that are deployed out there in the world. Um, it allowed us to understand how the user interface and the user experience needed to be created so that the, the, the different user and use cases of the people who interact with these filtration systems are properly served. Um, so that, that shadowing just allows our clients, uh, their, their subject matter experts to kind of show off what they do and, and talk through it. And, and it builds that kind of collaborative rapport that you want when you are, are building software for, for someone. Was there a part B to the question, Andy? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that, that that's really helpful in terms of just being able to, to kind of understand the environment of your clients and, and following them along. And I, you know, just extrapolating from that, you know, what, what are some ways that, that students might be able to kind of follow in the, those same footsteps of, you know, a job shadow or just showing that they're, they're continuing to learn what, what your needs are um, as, a, as a company? Well, I, um, I, I think that um, there, there are different specialties, obviously, in the software world. Um, and I, I know, of, of course, that companies like Unum and like Tyne, they have a lot of uh, security um, 
issues, not issues, excuse me, that's not the right word, but a lot of security concerns and they must protect their internal systems and we have to protect our clients. So a good good use of, of job shadowing is to is, would be to walk through uh, certain technology slices of, of the company like that to understand how it is a, a company builds their cybersecurity defenses and how they look for intrusion detection. Uh, it may never be your specialty as a software development person, but it is very valid and, and important information to understand. Um, and, and that would be, I think, a, a pretty good use for shadowing. Great, thank you. Um, Evan, uh, any additional thoughts? You know, what are ways that students can show that they're continuing to learn, continuing to, to stay relevant and, and do job shadows play a, a role in, in your organization in that capacity? Um, you know, I, th I think job shadows is, is case by case, you know, do, do they have interest? What do they want to learn about? And I used them um, when I was in college through oh, my faculty sponsor in grad school is kind of like my professor mentor. Um, and he oftentimes connected me with folks in his network from his past life before he moved into the, the scholastic realm when he was an, an IT professional. He connected me with folks that, hey, Evan wants to learn. Is it okay if he just sets up an hour with you, watches, sits it up on a meeting, whatever it was. So that gave me a really good um, exposure into how different companies operate. Um, when you're talking about how can we stay relevant, I think you know, be aware of the markets and the industry that your technology affects, whether it's insurance, whether it's water filtration systems, whether it's produce and agriculture, understanding market needs and consumer expectations. And I don't want to sound like a broken record, but everybody uses Amazon as like the customer experience, right? You click one button and in an hour, sometimes you have vegetables at your door, right? People didn't know they want that, but now they expect it from everywhere. So how can you align your um, industry or your company's deliverable to match those customer expectations. So I think having a good understanding of market direction and customer desires will oftentimes help you understand what technical, te what technical solutions are required to meet those needs. So I'd just say follow the, the market and, you know, let the consumer decide what they want and then help them get there the best way possible. Jack, anything to add? Well, I, I think when you ask about what can the students do to ensure that they are keeping abreast of, of what, what the current technologies are, what direction things are going in, I mean, I do think that that is something that it's not just a question for your students, right? It, it's everybody. How does how do all of us in the industry keep abreast of things because things continue to change? And no matter what role you're in, whether you know I'm an entry level programmer or it's myself, we all do that right to keep abreast of what's happening where are things going and as evan mentions we're constantly thinking about what do we need to be thinking about uh, both from a business perspective and then what technologies enable that to, to become a reality uh, so it's not just purely on just looking at technologies but it's also the you know the application of those technologies to solve a business problem or to meet the business's needs yeah. but having having students not just do as much reading uh, attending conferences, whether they be virtual or not, uh, joining into to some of the, the user groups that are in the main area, right? There are all kinds of user groups in, in Maine. Uh, to be able to both network with other folks and learn what other people are doing, as well as what's going on, where are things going? I think all of that is helpful just to, again, keep their mind as wide open and learn as much as they can. And that will It'll be something that will be fruitful for them for their entire careers because they will be doing that constantly. Uh, and so understanding and not being shy about networking with other people and reaching out when you hear about a company or somebody from this company that's doing something that's of interest that could be uh, applied to your area, just don't be afraid to reach out to them. Everybody, I mean, what's, what's neat is even though some of us um, are competing with each other, and I deal with a lot of CIOs and companies in uh, the Portland area and outside, and we compete with each other, but it doesn't matter. You know, we have lots of good conversations about problems that we're facing, uh, and we are more than willing to talk about what people are doing, where they go, and things like that, regardless of whether you're in competing companies. And I think that exchange of information is invaluable to keep abreast of what's going on and what do I need to know. 
Yeah, I think that that's great. And that's certainly something that I've noticed about, you know, the this kind of industry in particular is that it, it does seem like a pretty close knit community of, of folks that, you know, you have a common interest and in, regardless of what kind of company you're you happen to be working for, you know, it's it's all based on the same sort of interests and, and similar backgrounds. Um, Tynan, anything to add? I feel like everybody covered it pretty well. Um, yeah, I can't, <laughs> I can't really add much, I don't think. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Um, so I'm looking, I'm, I'm mindful of time here. And I think perhaps we, we just have time for one more question. Um, and I'd love to, to end it on, you know, um, do you have any kind of last pearls of wisdom for students that are, you know, entering the, the job market here and, and you know, considering that uh, we're still kind of in the midst of COVID and working in, in this sort of remote environment? Any, any last piece of advice? And Tynan, I'll start with you. <laughs> sure. Um, one thing I'll say for us is I know a lot of computer science individuals be watching this. One thing that we really want are individuals that are software engineers, computer science majors that are also really interested in information security. Because here at least and in other companies as well, we make our own proprietary products and maintain them and, and all sorts of things around threat detection, et cetera. So individuals that, because we were talking earlier about career tracks, you know, programming background with strong knowledge or broad understanding of information security super handy and important right now uh, and going forward whether it's here or somewhere else something we're really interested in um and you know, as far as the whole covid thing you know it's <laughs> but uh you know um I, I... what do i have to say about that you know a, a lot of companies are hiring to be tough but you know i think getting confident talking on a camera is useful <laughs> in this day and age, you know, uh, and, and obviously onboarding can be tough, especially if you're starting a new position that you don't, you know, your entry level per se, you don't have a lot of hands-on experience starting that remotely can be challenging, but I think it just comes back to being upfront and honest about what, you know, uh, not feeling afraid to reach out to individuals at the company you're working for to ask for help with things. Um, and just kind of maintaining that visibility. Uh, I think Evan mentioned that. Um, you know, especially if you're remote, critical, you know, you don't want to get lost. Um, so that's what I've got for you. Awesome. That's, that's great advice. Um, let's, let's do reverse order the last one. So Jack, uh, any pearls of wisdom for students setting out? <laughs> yeah, I think that almost goes back to, to how I started this with uh, be curious, ask questions. Uh, now's the time to learn as much as you can. Uh, about what's going on out there and what it is you like to do. Um, you know, I think that everybody that is hiring folks is not expecting you to walk in um, knowing you know, anything uh, about what our company does, except what you read on websites, right? And, and what you may have heard from people that work there. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to, to reach out to people. Uh, and I think that looking for those places that, again, have the same kind of mindset that you do and that have the same kind of values that you do. Uh, and that is something that it doesn't take too long to discover what a company is like. Um, and a lot of companies will say things about what they are and then you get in there and you really see what they're like. No, they're not quite like that. Uh, and so being able to ask questions, being able to experience what makes sense, trying to find people you know, and again, that networking really helps. I and mean, what I love to do is find people that are looking for a, a career or a job change that somebody in our company already knows, right? It's, it really helps to have that insight into somebody before they walk in the door as a candidate. And uh, that again, the more you network with people, the more that your name gets around. And I will tell you that the only interviewing I did formally where I walked into a place that nobody knew me uh, was my very first job. After that job, and I've been to eight different companies, and a lot of them were acquisitions and things like that, but uh, I've been at eight different companies and all of my positions I obtained because somebody else I worked with or knew 
recommended me to their company. Uh, and so it was, I didn't have to go searching. Uh, and so all that is just from your experiences with your colleagues and with networking with people outside your job. Yeah, that, that networking piece is is so huge. You know, the, there's some pretty staggering statistics, like 70% of people get a job because it's someone that they know in the organization. And that, that piece can be um, can be critical to, to your first step. Um, Evan, any any piece of advice that you would give a student setting out? Um, I, I think sometimes, you know, one, I'll, I'll go back to, and this isn't indicative of the market as a whole, but I think it, it, it has a fairly good indication of where we're heading, you know, a tech, an, a, a very old insurance company that is Unum is hiring over 300 IT employees next year. We currently have an IT shop of maybe close to 1100. And those are not replacements. That's not turnover. We're investing in technology upwards of 30% next year. So keep in mind that there are opportunities for you. So when we're talking about coronavirus, the pandemic, just kind of the state of the world right now, when it comes to your career, I'd say just be not afraid. There's opportunity out there. That being said, with the search for opportunity comes hearing no. And sometimes difficult experiences are the vegetables of life. And if you don't eat them, you won't grow <laughs> and you won't be healthy. So if you do hear no, understand what you did, have a little retrospective, your own little agile ceremony and kind of think critically about, you know, was it the technical piece? Was it this? What did I learn? Was it really a good fit for me? And is that the kind of company I would want to work for and mesh with? Because you're interviewing them too. So I'd be sure to keep all those things into account. And then I really echo what Jack said about, you know, networking. The way I think about it is make friends. You know, I still have contacts from college that now work at Microsoft with consulting firms. They're in different industries and, you know, play video games with them. You know, we're in a virtual environment, so find ways to socialize with them and keep that network alive. But then once you get into your company of choice, um, make sure that you find that buddy and start with one and then put another brick on top of that and expand that network because you need that person that you can ask no stupid questions to. You need your manager who understands that you do good work and then you need your senior leader mentor who's gonna really expand your horizons and give you that holistic view. So I think, you know, understanding that there's opportunity for you and then taking advantage of the social aspect of that opportunity are the two things that I would focus on. Thank you. Yeah, I love that the no's are the, the vegetables of life. <laughs> um, Mike, uh, any anything that you would add there? I think I'm going to take a slightly different cut at the, at the question, Andy, uh, with some some kind of day to day practical uh, recommendations. And in starting a career or, or even an internship in the in the age of COVID is is going to be a challenge. So uh, you've developed study habits by now. Uh, no way you uh, haven't to and to be able to do a, a program like USM. Uh, but you'll have to transition from, from a study uh, habit type discipline to a, a more structured work discipline. Um, it doesn't mean that you know, strap yourself to your desk for eight hours without, without coming up for air. That's not what I mean, but, but create, if you're working from home, working from a remote location, create a very disciplined environment for yourself when you start, when you finish, when you take breaks. Uh, Part of that discipline is going to be starting your day out knowing and planning what are you going to achieve that day. So you can track your own progress. And if any time any other remote colleague asks you, what are you doing? Uh, can you explain? Can you help? Well, you know, where are you going to be at the end of the week? You'll have a much clearer idea if you take that disciplined approach for working um, from, from remote locations. And from a, a technical uh, advice, I would say, uh, take a strong, deep look at cloud platforms. Uh, the world is going to be moving from on-premises equipment to the cloud, going to be developing truly cloud native applications that are going to change the world. Uh, and, and when you think about the 5G Wi-Fi, uh, that is, excuse me, the 5G cellular uh, connection coming up, the amount of data that can reach any mobile device is going to transform what people do with their mobile devices yet again. And all of that is going to rely on cloud back end applications and infrastructure. And no matter what you 
what interests you uh, in terms of technology or type of work, uh, that work will be done on the cloud. If you're highly analytical and you want to get into machine learning and artificial intelligence, well, that is where it lives right now. Um, if you want to get into serious data handling, there's really nothing like, like a cloud platform that allow you to learn it, test it, throw it away, do something different, change it. So uh, from a, a, a kind of a, a nuts and bolts uh, career recommendation, uh, no matter what, where you end up in what industry, if you bring uh, an understanding uh, and a capability of developing software in a cloud environment, you're going to be valuable across a lot of different companies. That'll be it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think the, it, the future is certainly exciting when it comes to, to some of that. And, uh, you know, as someone not involved in the industry, I'm excited to see what you all come up with next. Um, but I, I just want to express my, you know, sincere appreciation for, for all of you taking the time this afternoon to, to answer our questions. I know that our students got a lot out of this panel. I know I did. Um, and thank you, Professor Briggs, for, for joining me and Angela um, for Project Login for, for kind of helping co-sponsor this event. Uh, we sincerely appreciate it. and. Um, yeah, we um, we look forward to uh, kind of the, the next generation of, of uh, com uh, communicating with our students. So thank you all and, and have a, a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye.